The 10th and 11th centuries, an overview. England now started to form into a coherent country. This was brought about by the efforts of the kings from Alfred the Great onwards. There is no evidence that any area constituted what a specific king thought should be the area he ruled, merely what he could rule and where he could gather taxes. In the case of Ethelred II or Ethelred the Unready as he is more commonly known, as much in taxes as possible just to pay the Dane Guild. It does not seem to occur to the raiding armies that just collecting a percentage of money would be a more efficient means of making a profit than raping and pillaging and destroying it all before. Although it may well mean the raping and pillaging ceased, uh, so maybe wasn't thought of an option, who knows. The area of England does appear to be mainly those conquered by the Anglos, Saxons and Danish and Norwegian Vikings. This includes the most productive farming land. A part that is from the lowlands of Scotland around the Firth of Forth and the Clyde estuary and just south of there. The Viking pillaging continues until Swain sees that England is there for the taking and so decides to tap the money supply at its source. But here fortune intervenes because the person with whom the fates will decide should get the interminable mint of money is Canute and he is not just in it for the wealth. He is a man of his time and being a good king in the eyes of his god to him seems to mean more than an extra dollop of dosh, to the extent that he clamps down on corruption. And while others may have said they were for the observance of the laws, Canute has it proclaimed in the village and town that any officials not fulfilling their duties under the law are to be reported to him so that punishment can be seen for all. We don't actually have any true reference of this being carried out, but everything points that after his death, it was the case. In the 11th century England, there would most likely have been disparities in its enforcement anyway. But it does seem to have been largely observed in deed and not just word. This is probably why the wealth of the nation comes back so quickly. Once the pent-up demand is beginning to be serviced after the Danegeld ceased to be paid. As the number of goods being produced and likewise consumed increases, trade increases. Also, with the end of the large raiding armies, trade prospers. The burrs of Alfred the Great had markets at their centre. Most of these markets will have been local. Nonetheless, they were there and those best positioned started to prosper. London and York were thriving and expanding. The architecture at this time, however, suffered severe blows. The lack of regular income due to the ravages of the Danes took its toll in building development. And it seems to have nearly halted at the beginning of the 10th century and little improved later. The continual depletion of the treasury stymied any advancement of design. There is little left now of the wooden building from this period, mainly due to the paucity of new stone works, probably caused by the upsets of Athelvad, but then with no impetus from the king. It is not until Edward the Confessor that any building of note is erected, and the Westminster Abbey, his most famous construction, is not the one that we see today. The counties, or more properly the shires, were by the 11th century more or less in place, below the Dane law that is, and the shires themselves were divided into hundreds, and the hundreds were there for tax raising and other administrative purposes, like the settling of legal disputes between farmers and the holding of courts, which in many places was every four weeks. These hundreds seem to have come into being about the reign of Edgar, who was the king from 959 to 975. The courts and taxes would require people who could read and write. So the monasteries kept on supplying the people with these skills. From Alfred's day onwards, even into Athelred's reign, the taxes were raised very efficiently. By contemporary standards in Europe, 
the children of the royal court and churls are the ones who seem to have been educated and trained to the civil service. Under Canute's administration, a coterie of fighting men grew around the king. These were the housecarls or huscarls, his personal bodyguard, who were the equivalent of the thanes in Ethelred's reign. Canute also maintained a small fleet of 16 ships as a core navy. They were paid for by service and taxation through the kingdom. That this is taxation by a foreign king and was able to be collected with little apparent resistance should not be ignored when considering that another foreign conqueror would need to raise money to pay his way. Virtually everything is based around the farm at this time. A blacksmith was probably not employed full time at his work, although there might have been many who only did farm work during the harvest. The number of charters and legal documents that are starting to be used from the building of forts to abbeys, it shows that the written word was slowly spreading. Legal documents among the nobility and clerics now started to be commonplace. The land laws are in place, which means that a person's land holding can be defended in court, and there is the title to prove it. This also covers the serfs. Most of cloth making would be part time, but like the blacksmiths, there were probably people who employed themselves for most of the year. Weaving and their work in agriculture would be merely for harvest time. There were a few more wares around to be sold and traded. The standard of dress would be slightly improved. Certainly there is evidence that the quality has risen. The nobility started to be just a little bit more removed with the aid of partitions within the great hall for sleeping. Also, there were more wall hangings, which of course required more thread, which required more people making that thread, but also gave more comfort with less drafts and so warmer living quarters. Slavery was still around, but was much less prevalent. And there were serfs who had the advantage of being tied to the land and would have their own piece of land to earn some subsistence. And they were mentioned in the title deeds. So they couldn't be sold except if the land was sold, but that part of it was theirs. Going by the only record available anywhere in Europe, the Doomsday Book in 1086, and working back, the population was probably around the 1.2 million mark. Although severe famine in 1002 will have ensured it wasn't higher and could well have been nearer 1.1 million. The weather had started to get warmer due to global warming. The medieval warm period begins around 950 AD. If you found this greatly, please thumbs up and press the subscribe button to get the latest updates and any mentions on social media will be appreciated. Thank you.